Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Aaron Miller, the medical director of the Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center for Multiple Sclerosis. Um, for those of you who've been at our symposium before, welcome back. For those of you who are here for the first time, we particularly appreciate your coming in what's been a very difficult week for New Yorkers. Um, uh, I hope that all of you are all right, your property and loved ones, and our hearts and prayers to those people who have gone through very difficult times. But we, we have a very uh, full and, and I hope informative day for you. Just a couple of housekeeping details. We didn't plan any uh, um, breaks during the program. Uh, I think it's easier if people need uh, to take care of personal needs just to go out. You'll miss just a couple of moments. We will have a, a lunch, um, a nice lunch for you. Um, and we've got a lot of information to convey, I hope. Um, we will um, start right off with uh, Dr. Michelle Fabian. Dr. Fabian uh, has been part of the uh, Corinne Goldsmith Dickinson Center since 2009 when she joined us as a fellow, having completed her neurology residency at Mount Sinai. Um, and after she completed two years of fellowship with us, she stayed on and is now an assistant professor of neurology at Mount Sinai and uh, one of our uh, young and talented attending MS specialists. Uh, before she came to Mount Sinai, she had done her medical school at Case Western Reserve and uh, previously graduated from the um, currently undefeated uh, University of Notre Dame. Uh, as a fellow, she received a prestigious fellowship from the National MS Society, the Sylvia Lowry Fellowship, and in addition to her clinical responsibilities, Michelle is currently the principal investigator on a, a number of important clinical trials in MS. So Michelle is going to talk to us about multiple sclerosis 2012, back to basics. Good morning. I'm really excited to be here to be talking to you about the basics of multiple sclerosis, and I'm really excited that my football team is 9-0. and It's very kind of Dr. Miller. Um, but I think that um, it's very important. This is a disease that has affected many of you in significant ways, and it's really important to understand um, about the disease and to um, get the perspective on it of, um, you know, um, the basics of it. Because I always uh, teach my patients that knowledge is power. If you know, then you can move forward. And if you're left in a place where you're uncertain about what's going on, then often that feels a lot uh, scarier. This is what we're going to discuss today in the talk. The first thing is what MS is. The second is risk factors for multiple sclerosis. The third is common presenting symptoms of MS. The fourth is diagnosis of MS. And finally, how MS is classified. And to start out, we'll just look at this slide about the location of where MS affects a person. And this is important. So MS only affects the central nervous system. There's two parts to the nervous system. There's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain, the spinal cord, and also, in, in case of MS, the optic nerve, which extends directly from the brain. What that means is that it doesn't affect the nerves that come out beyond the spinal cord. And that's important because when a patient comes in with symptoms that look to be peripheral, and that's uh, you know, what a neurologist is specialized in figuring out, if this is something that looks like it's from the nerves or from the brain, if it looks like it's from the nerves, then we're thinking this is probably not related to MS. So it really only affects the central nervous system. And this is just a picture um, to set up the next slide of the neuron. And what the neuron is, is the cell that is uh, part of the brain. 
And you can see that um, over to one side is the cell body. Um, and that's kind of the important parts of the cell and the power generators of the cell. And then you see that there is this uh, thing called the axon. This is the axon here. Um, and what, um, what that does is it sends the information from the brain or from part of the spinal cord down to wherever it needs to be. So if uh, you want to move your arm, for instance, and you think, I need to move my arm, that happens in the brain, and then that information gets transmitted down through the spinal cord to the arm. And you can see that surrounding that axon is something called myelin. And that's like an insulator. And I was really, um, I was okay in physics, but it wasn't my strongest uh, suit. But um, when something is insulated, what happens is the information is uh, transferred uh, more efficiently and quickly. And so as you know, uh, probably in MS, this is what is classically thought to be most affected. And so uh, MS is the most common demyelinating disease of the CNS. So you can see on the top of this slide, that's a healthy axon, like I just showed you in the picture before. The next um, axon down has been uh, damaged, uh, presumably, most commonly, by MS. And so the myelin, that nice insulator around the axon, has been eaten up a little bit. The last picture is a picture of the axon itself being injured, and that also can occur in MS. And this is a um, slide I entitled MS Immunology 101. This is very complex, and I got um, the prettiest picture and one of those simpler pictures to talk about uh, the immunology of MS, but it is very complex. But what we think happen is uh, T cells, which are white blood cells, so we have certain red blood cells carry the oxygen, that's what we usually think of as blood. White blood cells are more uh, dealing with uh, the immune system, and T cells are a kind of white blood cell. So what happens is they become activated in the blood by something that is unknown. It could be a virus, it could be another trigger in the environment. And so they are activated, they're excited, and they're ready to do their work, which is to fight an infection or to fight off whatever kind of foreign invader is coming in. But what we think happens is that they get confused. And instead of fighting off the foreign invader, they enter the brain and they mistake the myelin, which you saw in the previous slide, uh, for an enemy. And what happens is then it, these inflammatory proteins um, that we know about are released. And the signal gets spread for the white blood cells to bring in all of their friends. And instead of just this one white blood cell, then it becomes uh, many white blood cells that are focused on uh, causing injury to the myelin and then also at times to the axon, which is beneath the myelin. And there's other white blood cells that we know that are also involved in this. So that's what we think happens. And so what that does is the white blood cells focus on an area in the central nervous system, as we've discussed, the brain, the spinal cord, or the optic nerve, and they uh, localize and become a collection in an area. And that's what's called a lesion. So many of you have heard that word. And what it means um, is a collection of blood cells causing injury to an area. And you can see that the, the one picture, the arrow, is pointing to a lesion. And that's what it looks like on an MRI. And the other picture is just if you put uh, the brain or the spinal cord under a microscope, and you could actually see there is a collection of white blood cells in the tissue causing the injury. And these pictures here just show the active lesion. So one of the mistakes doctors make, I think, when I'm in the office is that I just assume that what I'm saying, the patient knows. My husband's always reminding me, um, you're speaking doctor speak now, switch over to speaking like a regular person. Um, and so I often say to a patient, well, good news, there's no active lesions, at which point they say, Dr. Fabian, what is an active lesion? Very good question. So what an active lesion is, is 
when the contrast is given, so first the MRI is done, and then if you have gotten uh, MRI, you know that the next thing that happens often is they put the uh, contrast in the IV. And the contrast goes around the body, and it goes to the areas in the brain where um, the blood vessel is a little leakier. And the white blood cells, as you remember, the white blood cells are in the blood, and they travel into the brain and spinal cord. And so the contrast follows the white blood cells into the areas that are new and active um, in the brain or the spinal cord. And that occurs for one to three months. And so when we have an MRI, this uh, MRI here, it's a little tough because I can't uh, point to both. But um, what you can see is in the um, three of those MRIs are just the regular MRIs. And then the one that's in the uh, bottom right corner is the MRI after the contrast was given. So you can see that there's many more uh, spots, hopefully, um, on the one on the left than on the one on the right. And the, so what that is is that the uh, one on the right is where the active lesions are, the new lesions in the last one to three months that have been developed. So that gives us a sense of if a patient's MS is currently active. So switching over, uh, what causes MS? So currently the cause uh, does remain unknown, um, although we do have some ideas about what causes it. Um, and it's likely it's multiple causes that contribute to give the person the risk for MS. So genetics is uh, one thing that um, gives patients an increased risk. We'll go over uh, a virus potentially, though many have been studied and one virus has not been found to be causative. Uh, something else in the environment that patients are exposed to. Uh, deficiency of vitamin D and smoking. Um, so uh, one thing that we know is that uh, patients that get MS, that uh, women are two to three times higher, uh, uh, they're more likely to get it than uh, men. And this uh, appears to be increasing. And also, um, if the uh, affected patient is, it depends if the parent is a female or if, if the parent that has MS is a, uh, the mother or father. So if it's the uh, mother, then the child is slightly more likely to get MS. And this is a slide that shows um, the risk factor in terms of genetics. So it's one in a thousand in uh, the U.S. population. Uh, the risk for an identical twin is between 25 and 35 percent. So identical twin means that they share 100 percent of the same DNA. And so that means that it's not all genetics because then the risk would be 100%. Um, but it's only 25 to 35%. A fraternal twin, which means that they were twins, but they have different DNA, is the same as a first degree relative. So that means a child, a parent, a sibling, and that risk is two to 5%. So what I always highlight to patients is that means 98 to 95% chance that the person will not get MS. That's the way that I think about that. And if you're adopted into a family, then you have the risk of the general population. And this is just a slide that um, shows, the slide I just showed you was what we know about genetics now. But what we're moving towards, which is very exciting, is instead of just being able to tell a person um, you have, you know, because you're, uh, mother or your sibling has MS, you have a 2 to 5% chance. Someday, perhaps, what will happen is a person can get tested and get a uh, risk score based on their actual genetics. And so that is not available today, but um, perhaps in the future that's what we will uh, hope to be able to offer to uh, family members. Another uh, risk factor that we know about is geographic risk. So in general, the farther away somebody lives from the equator, the higher the risk for getting MS. 
the highest risk of MS is in the Caucasian populations of Europe and then the uh, former colonies of Europe. And uh, lower risk for other ethnic uh, groups, um, but a lower risk means anytime we've looked for MS, we typically have found it in a population, but lower risks in uh, African Americans, Native Americans, Mexican, uh, Puerto Rican, and Japanese. But that's an interesting observation that has been made about uh, the uh, risk closer and farther away from the equator. It seems to be lessening than what was first uh, discovered, but, but that does exist. Another risk factor, which um, we will be discussed later and may uh, relate to the geographic risk, is vitamin D deficiency. So low vitamin D has been implicated in many diseases, not just in MS. But also, observations have been made repeatedly that patients with MS are more likely to have a vitamin D deficiency. And what uh, we need, and we are going to be uh, doing, or there is going to be a trial done in uh, vitamin D supplementation to know whether supplementing um, vitamin D can treat MS. So right now, uh, what typically is done is we make sure that a patient is in the normal range, because it's better to have a person in the normal range than to go back um, you know, after the trial's done and look and find and see um, that people could have been in the normal range the whole time. So that's what we do right now. Another risk factor which I um, always get excited about with my patients is smoking. So we do know that many uh, multiple studies have shown an association between smoking and the risk for MS. And studies also show that smokers have a higher risk to transition from relapsing remitting MS to progressive MS. And so um, this is something that um, can be modified, so that's exciting. People come in and they say, what can I do to uh, make my MS uh, you know, behave more gently and to, uh, to treat the MS? And for patients that are smokers, I I'm happy to tell them that if they quit, that is very good for the MS. And I'm happy to remind them repeatedly, if they do come in still smoking, that stopping it is a good idea. Um, and the reason why is that uh, smoking is uh, you know, a neurotoxin likely. So we already know that MS affects the neurons. And it affects the myelin in the, the axons. If you add another toxin to that, it can only make it worse. And it also may have effects on the immune system directly. So uh, the next question is uh, thinking more about how patients are affected by MS. And um, you know the clinical presentation that patients uh, have with MS. And so a lot of times uh, when patients come in and I'm taking their history and I ask them, tell me about your MS attacks. And, they're not sure sometimes what, you know, I'm uh, talking about. So what we think about um, in terms of an MS attack or a relapse or an exacerbation, those are all exactly the same things. And what we're talking about are new symptoms that are present for greater than 24 hours but less than one month. And what that means is, if you, if you think about when I was describing how uh, a lesion is formed, the white blood cells are traveling to an area to cause uh, the damage to the myelin. And it takes time, it doesn't happen instantly. And so that's why it takes a day. So it's a very natural thing, but patients will call up and say, my right hand was tingling for two minutes. Um, you know, I say, that's, you know, I'm glad you called. If you had a concern, that's good. But two minutes is not um, enough time that we would worry that this was actually a new thing coming from MS. So maybe you compress a nerve, something in the peripheral nervous system, you know, there's a bunch of different reasons, but it's uh, likely not a new MS attack. Uh, usually the symptoms are gradual and onset. Now this is always usually, everybody has a different and unique uh, story to how that MS affects them. But um, when something occurs suddenly, we think of other reasons that it could have occurred um, instead of MS. 
So uh, that is maybe somewhat of a comforting thing just in the way that uh, you don't typically have to worry that um, it's, the symptoms just gonna come on all at once at maximum. It's usually over days, the first day something might not be right and then it just becomes evident over a few days. It occurs in a localizable part of the nervous system. That's really important. And I think it's a, a something uh, that I really try to stress to my patients because, of course, especially when you're first diagnosed and you're not sure what your body is going through, if you wake up and you don't feel good, you think must be the MS. And I do always tell my patients, we can blame the MS for a lot of things, we can't blame it for everything. And so um, things that are not localizable sometimes are not due to MS because Again, the white blood cells are focusing in on an area. So if you wake up and uh, you just don't feel yourself, it may not be a new MS relapse. And the other thing is no signs pointing to a pseudo-exacerbation. All that means is that when somebody has another stress on the body, so typically that would be a fever, infection, um, but it also could be uh, some uh, mental stress that somebody's going through, uh, other things, you're not feeling right overall, an old symptom may come back. That doesn't mean that the MS is active. It just means that at that point in time, while you're having the fever or such, that the old symptom is, is able to kind of uh, show itself again. But the take home point from this is that if you have any new symptoms that seem to be neurological and they last for more than 24 hours, we wanna know. And, you know, um, I, I think it's important. I, I like to um, stay on top of things in terms of um, I don't want a patient to be going through something alone. So that's one thing is they come in and it's a week has gone by and they say, I've had this symptom. And I'm like, why did you sit home and worry about it a week? Let me worry about it. Um, what would be great is if I could worry about it and you don't, but at least we could worry together instead of you at home worrying by yourself. So that's one thing. And the other thing is we can, you know, maybe do something about it. So if it is something that's longer than a day, I want to know about it sooner rather than later. And then uh, common first symptoms of MS. So something that Dr. Miller, um, you know, often says to his patients and has taught me is that, you know, MS is unpredictable, but it is not predictably bad. And that's a good mantra to have. Um, especially in the beginning when you're not sure how it's going to affect you, it's, it's not predictably bad. Common uh, first symptoms include visual symptoms, sensory symptoms, so that would be typically numbness and tingling, weakness of a limb, and dizziness. So we talked about what is an attack. The other thing is what is progression. So those are the two ways that MS uh, most broadly can affect people. So progression, instead of, I told you, an attack is something that um, comes on the last 24 hours. What I didn't say about the one month, by the way, is that it doesn't mean that the symptom can only last one month, because that would be great. And usually symptoms do get better in days to weeks from an attack. But sometimes people can have some leftover symptoms. That's different, though, than progression. So I think when people do have a symptom from an attack, at the next visit, they come in and they say, I'm fairly certain I have progressive disease because the symptom didn't go away. I still have the numbness and tingling, or I still have you know, trouble with um, slight weakness or something like that. But that's different, because if you have it, but it's the same, that's not progression. What progression is is the gradual worsening of symptoms over months and years. So instead of days and weeks for an attack, it's over months and years. And instead of uh, inflammation, which we talked about with the white blood cells, it's more likely that it is degeneration that the axon itself, not the myelin around it, is being affected. And uh, current therapies are targeted more towards the inflammation, but you're gonna hear more about progressive disease uh, coming up. Uh, and that future therapies will focus on stopping and repairing the degeneration as well. So that's the difference between an attack and progression. And when a patient comes to see me, I ask a lot of questions. 
And um, these are the things that I'm really focused on knowing. And if you go to your MS doctor, I know it's an overwhelming experience uh, at times, especially the first visit. But these are the things that we focus on and the things that um, it would be helpful sometimes if a patient could um, even write down a list of things similar to this to, so we could focus on these as well. So it's important to know about previous episodes, previous attacks. It's important to know about chronic symptoms because we do care about those chronic symptoms. And so that would be the leftover symptoms that I told you about. Bo uh, bladder, bowel, sexual symptoms, fatigue, mood, and cognitive function. So you're gonna hear about all of this stuff uh, later on in the day. And then also about progressive symptoms. So these are the things that we focus on and it lets us get a perspective about how MS has affected this patient. And how do we diagnose MS in a patient? So what you will read about um, is dissemination in time and dissemination in space. What that exactly means is dissemination uh, just means at more than one time. So, um, so for instance, for dissemination in time, we need to know that a patient has had uh, multiple attacks, so more than one relapse, or an MRI that shows the same thing, that at more than one time, MS has affected the central nervous system. And so we can do that in a couple ways, either by seeing two MRIs, so you'll often see us compare MRIs and say, oh, there was a new lesion on the second MRI that is a diagnosis of MS, or if the MRI, um, and it's a little more technical, but if it shows active lesions and non-active lesions at the same time. The other thing that we need to know is that, it is a, uh, that there's dissemination in space. And what that means is that it's not the same thing that's occurred over and over. So if it was, you know, the vision was affected uh, temporarily at one time and then there was numbness at another time, that's two different parts of the nervous system. So that's what dissemination in space means. And we can do that based on the history and the exam and also based on MRI findings if it's more than one area of the nervous system that's been affected. And as um, always, that there's no better explanation for symptoms. And the tests we use, as I already mentioned, the most powerful tool that we have is MRI. And MRI is very, very good and powerful for diagnosing MS. And so these are typical uh, MRIs of patients with MS. And the lesions occur in areas that are specific, areas that surround the place where the spinal fluid is held in the brain, uh, around the ventricles, and towards the outside of the brain, and then in the spinal cord. And this is with the arrow there, that's helpful to me, that's the, um, that's the uh, area in the spinal cord that's been affected. Um, a typical lesion there. Another test that is sometimes used is spinal tap. It's not required, and we actually use it fairly rarely. Um, but in certain situations, it does help us. And the main goal is to look for oligoclonal bands, which is not an easy word to say. But what they are are antibodies in the spinal fluid. And if they're there, that is more support for a diagnosis of MS. And it can help uh, the MS specialist in treatment decisions. And it is safe, and it is minimally invasive, because there are a lot of urban legends and such out there about spinal taps, but in general, uh, this procedure is very well tolerated. And we also use blood work at times to help us. And so I told you there should be no better explanation for the patient's symptoms and MRI. And so the, the uh, blood work that's uh, typically done um, could be tests for Lyme disease, B12 deficiency, syphilis, and some other rheumatologic diseases like lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, some other um, autoimmune diseases. But the very important thing to know is that um, if there are no um, symptoms to point to a different disease, it most likely is not that other disease. And so uh, that's why we ask a patient, do you have any findings on the skin? Do you have a rash? Do you have any joint pain? Other things that might point to a different diagnosis. 
And so uh, if those aren't present, then it's likely because those other things uh, are not occurring. And uh, so this is about the different types of MS that there are. And this is made based on a patient's history. And this is one of the most common questions that I get in the office, and it's very um, understandable why that is. So the most important questions to ask when we're talking about uh, what type of MS a patient has are, has the patient had attacks, which we've talked about what an attack is, and has the patient had progression? And by answering those questions, we can classify what type of MS a patient has. Now, it's important to remember that every patient has their own MS. So you will typically not hear me telling a patient at the end of the visit, okay, this is the type of MS you have. But the question is often and naturally asked to me. But um, it's most important to classify MS so we can make sure that people are in the right uh, trials for research and to get a sense of uh, how the MS has affected them. But it, it, it really is, I focus more on the patient always. I always focus more on the patient than on the MRI, um, and definitely more than on giving them a label of, okay, this is the kind of MS you have, and so, uh, you know, uh, this is what we're gonna do. No, we focus on the, on the patient and uh, make the treatment plan based on that. But these are um, pictures here of the different types of MS. And they are not um, stages. I think a lot of people think of uh, MS uh, classification, at least when they're talking to me, like stages of cancer, you know, one to four. But it's not like that, actually. And uh, what you can see from these different diagrams is just if you picture, um, you see these rectangles in um, three of the uh, squares there. Uh, the rectangles are signifying attacks, OK? So I told you the questions are, has a patient had attacks and have they had progression? So um, all of those squares that have rectangles in them, those patients have had attacks. The other thing with progression, what you're going to see is that upward hill. So you guys see that in uh, three of those, there are hills going upward. That's signifying progression. And so then we can just go through the different types and then we can see. So the first one is relapsing remitting MS. So you can see that person has the rectangle, so they've had attacks. But in between attacks, they don't have symptoms that are getting worse. And so that's why the, the line is straight in between attacks. Does that make sense? You see that? OK. The second one is uh, secondary progressive MS. That one, you can see there are the rectangles, so there have been attacks but then there also are the upward hill. So typically a patient will have attacks, and then at some point they will develop symptoms that will um, increase gradually over months and years, and that's the progressive phase. The bottom two, the patient starts out with the upward hill. So they start up with uh, just slowly progressive symptoms, but then the only difference is you see that the one more towards the right, there's a rectangle because that person has some relapses in it as well. So that's uh, progressive relapsing MS. So those are the different types of MS. The way that we uh, make that classification in a patient is by what they tell us. So it's by listening to a patient, by listening to their symptoms, and then we can get a sense of what type of MS they have. The other uh, two types of MS, one type is radiologically isolated syndrome. That is a newer thing that we um, see quite typically in the MS center. This is a patient without any attacks or progression, but has just found to have an MRI that looks like multiple sclerosis. So that's um, something that we um, deal with on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. The other thing is clinically isolated syndrome, which is something you may have heard about that's simply the first attack of MS. So that's because I told you for MS, multiple sclerosis more than one time uh, that a patient has had symptoms, but if there's only one attack, then they may get a diagnosis of clinically isolated syndrome. And uh, 
we could skip over that one. I just wanted to uh, talk about why a patient, um, in my opinion, why a patient uh, should come to an MS center, such as the Mount Sinai MS center. Um, and the reason is because when we think about a patient, we're thinking about this patient in a comprehensive manner. So of course, because I'm a doctor, we sometimes people say doctors were, you know, have egos and things. Um, but no, that's not true, hopefully. I put myself, I, you know, neurologist is at the top there, but we have a huge um, network of people that help us to treat the patient. It's about the patient and helping the patient deal with uh, what they've been through. And so, you know, a neurologist, um, but also a nurse practitioner, a medical assistant, social worker, psychiatrist, urologist, physiatrist, physical therapist, clinical research team, and the administrative staff. Everybody that works in the MS center is there to focus on the patient. And I think that really leads to a patient that is getting uh, state-of-the-art treatment, but also getting symptoms um, carefully and aggressively controlled. And somebody that is hopefully um, dealing with their MS and then moving on with their life. Because that's the, that's, um, the dream. <laughs> but that somebody gets treated for the MS and then um, it becomes part of the background again, okay? And so that's what we try to do, um, and, and we do it in a comprehensive manner. And I'm glad for that, because I can't do it all as the neurologist. I need everybody else to do it with me. And so in summary, so MS, as we talked about, is a disease with variable symptoms. Smoking and vitamin D are potentially modifiable risk factors. We make the diagnosis by history and by MRI. And we talked about the classifications of MS, and that our goal is to give every uh, patient the healthiest and best life possible. Thank you.